It's PowerPoint. Let's see what's up first. Let's give our worship team a round of applause. You guys did amazing. Oh, look, okay. So if you guys can look at um, some of the projectors, we first of all, we welcome everybody here who's joining us on live, here in person. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome to New Hope Thursdays. Yes, thank you for tuning in. We ask you guys to come join us live. It's better. It's better here. Worship is it's a little bit better. It's always better in person. You yes. get the, you get the full worship. <laughs> yeah. And we don't cut you off at the end of service <laughs> when we minister. <laughs> so if you guys can look at the screen, we just had this weekend. Uh, we know it was Father's Day weekend, but on Saturday, we had a marriage retreat. And you guys are just going to see some pictures from this past Saturday. This is our second marriage retreat. Um, I believe it's Llegando a Ser Uno. Um, reaching or learning how to be one. Yeah, learning how to be one. And I highly recommend it. Um, it was so much fun. Joshua, if you can just take away my echo, I'm done singing. <laughs> but it was, it was really fun whether you are married, hoping to get married one day. This is nice. I, I, I like that picture because that picture shows the amount of faith that New Hope has. That stage oh, the altar. We were on did the not stage. fall. <laughs> and there was like a whole bunch of us on it. Yeah. No, but it was great. It was really fun. It was very, um, it was a learning experience because you learn so much. Especially, you know, knowing as someone who's, who's been married, it's definitely different. All three stages, single, dating, married, completely different stages. And just learning, you know, preemptively is always a great thing. So it was really fun. We learned a lot. We even played some games. That was pretty fun to watch the adults play games and always, you know, get confused or not know what to do. It, it was a really fun experience. We put some pictures so you guys can see what, what it was about. And, you know, we'll have it also hopefully maybe on Sunday so that way the whole church can also know. And even if you're like, you know, it doesn't really apply to me, I'm pretty sure you, you, have, you know people who either are married, maybe your parents are married, or just friends, that you can always refer us to. Because it's not just for the people here, but it's also for all those who live in the area. So think of it this way. Maybe I might not go because I'm single or, or because maybe I can't go have to work, but you know people, and we can always spread the word. Yes, and this is not only for marriages. Of course, they're catering to marriages, but, for example, this... Um, this past retreat, they were talking about problem-solving skills. Oh, definitely. Uh, you know, um, people, like interpersonal skills, basically. So learning how to solve issues, um, confronting. And a lot of the times, we don't know how to um, because we were never taught uh, when we were children. Mm -hmm. So instead of going and learning from a place of trauma, we're learning from a healed place. Exactly. It's more like learning about the other person and how to best communicate, how to best link yourself with that person, whether it's your significant other, could be your parents, could be siblings, could be friends, co-workers, bosses. You yeah. know, it's always good to learn how to work with others. Yes, and I learned that you're either a rhinoceron, or rhinoceron, yes, rhinoceron, or um, a rhino, or Rhinos what is it? Um, oh, I forgot to say oh. rhinoceron. Rhin rhinoceros. Rhinoceron. 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 A rhino. Uh, <laughs> yes, a rhino. It's a hedgehog. I thought it was a porcupine. Both, yeah. Well, more of a porcupine because porcupines actually sting you. Yeah. So well, not you sting see, you, but like it's spicy. When you join, you'll understand what these little figures mean. So, well, that's enough about the marriage retreat. Uh, join us next time. Uh, it'll be fun, believe me. So the next slide, um, I believe it's for our PowerPoint LED or Pro LED. Yeah, we, as you guys all know, we are having a raffle. And for those watching us online who don't know, we are having a raffle. What for? Well, we want to upgrade our stage. It's been great to us. You know, it's been here for who knows how many years? 18, 15? About 15. I don't know how long we've been in this temple. Maybe 15 years. You just need a little bit of a face. Yeah, it's just exactly. Just how we put face creams. You know, we pluck our eyebrows. You know, guys trim their beards and all that stuff. Our stage needs a little love, too. So, unfortunately, it is not cheap. Uh, so we are raising funds to get like a nice upgrade to the to our stage, and we're doing this by raffling off a plot of land. Yes. So it's a plot of land in where? North of Orlando, I believe it is. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah, like north of Orlando, and it's a I believe ten thousand square foot plot yes. of land. Each ticket is a hundred dollars, 
so you guys can get your tickets uh, during service or after yeah. service? Yeah, every, s well, su Sunday after service, we're going to have a table over there where you can buy tickets. And yeah, tickets are $100, which, you know, can sometimes cost a dent. But if you win, the land is worth like around 20 grand. So, hey. You know, you, that's a very nice investment. Imagine, so $100, get 20 grand, also like $500. Also, no, actually, I'll sell all the money in my bank just to get it all back. Yes, so now proceeding from there, if you guys, we need some help on our teams. So if you guys can join us in any team, you can speak to Gianni, Carolina, myself, or Vanessa after service or any time throughout the week. And we can situate you wherever you guys want to, you know, help us out in. And with that being said, piano, come on, don't leave me alone. Hey. Is your mic. Uh -oh. Oh. Hello. Oh, right. so. so we have many ways to give. Obviously, bucket is for cash and for yes. envelopes. We also have through Zelle, which is the most yes. popular way. Just note, when you send a Zelle on the memo, please write tithes and offerings. So that way it will be easier for the people in accountability to know where your money is going. Yes. So, so. do you want to pray or do you want me to pray? So let's have the bucket here metaphorically as a, to symbolize all the zells going online. And if you can just, you know, like Pastora does it, let's extend our hands. It's with the old fashioned way. You know, this is your money, our money. So, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you because we are able to give. We thank you because you provide us with the means to be able to always give to you and to always sow unto others. We pray that every single. Uh, bill every single zell that was sent will be multiplied tenfold we pray that we can see it multiplied in either more money and job opportunities and mysterious ways that you will just bless us and you will just exalt your name through us we thank you abba we give you all the glory and we give you all the honor in your name we pray amen amen so without any further ado we won't take any more time um, I'm going to throw the mic, whoever catches it, you're bringing the word tonight. Uh, I'm just kidding. Gianni? Pray your roulette. <laughs> <laughs> Let's all give Gianni a round of applause. Thank you, sir, and ma'am, wife of mine. <laughs> okay, so how are you guys doing tonight? If no one has already asked that today. All right. Just, all right, cool. Well, with the amount of people that are here just tonight, I'll accept the response. <laughs> Okay, guys, so does anybody remember what we talked about last, what Kalina preached about last, last week? All right. <laughs> One more thing, anything else? <laughs> if not, it's perfectly fine, because I'm going to elaborate on a lot of something that she touched on, and that's vulnerability. So I think we have a PowerPoint. Miriam, if you could put that up. I think it says the word vulnerability just so you guys are very clear. That's what we're going to be talking about tonight, okay? So there's a lot of power and vulnerability, and I don't know if you guys truly know the significance of the word or what it means, but that's what we're going to talk about tonight, okay? So I, and Carolina touched upon it last week, and I felt that it needed to be elaborated on even more so that we could all really understand why it's something that it's, that's important. So first of all, I want to define the word vulnerable, and I think we have the next slide, that actually has the Google uh, image or description, the de definition of what the word is. And all it means is susceptible to physical or emotional attack or harm. You guys understand what that means, right? So you're susceptible to something, meaning that it's very easy for something to come at you, for something to happen to you. And a lot of times it might even be in a negative sense when you're talking about especially physical harm, okay? So... When you're being vulnerable, you're being your true self, okay? So when you leave, wait, let's, right. So when, it, when you're being vulnerable in an emotional sense, that's what I'm talking about. So the definition talks about physical and emotional vulnerability. But what I'm going to talk about tonight, obviously, more than anything is the emotional side. But to understand it a little bit better, I want to talk about physical vulnerability as well. So. When you leave your emotions susceptible to harm or attack, it's kind of like you're in war. Like, let's just say you guys went all, we all went to war for whatever reason we got drafted. And then you go out without any sort of armor, nothing to protect you. That's you going out there, and you're vulnerable. So I think that's pretty simple to explain. 
in another sense, or you go out in the middle of the war and you're in bright colors, instead of like in the camouflage that you usually wear in war, so that people can see you, like it's hard to see you, so that it's easier for them to miss or just to just not see you in general. You're wearing bright colors, pretty much saying, hey, here, look at me. I'm like a mile away, but you can see me anyway. So you're making yourself susceptible to any sort of attack. And this is obviously more of a physical, well, a physical attack that we're talking about here, okay? So think about that scenario where you're going out into like a battlefield or something that's not that easy to deal with, but you're not going with any sort of protection. You're not going with any armor. Or at the same time, you're even going with bright colors saying, here I am, do whatever you will to me. Okay, so when you're vulnerable emotionally, it's like when you go into a social, social situation and you leave all your filters, stuff like all your doubts and your security, insecurities, all your need to present yourself like if your life is perfect and that you have all, all the best things and only the best things, and you leave all that stuff at home. You leave it under your bed. Instead of going on to the world and presenting yourself the way that you think people want to see you, you present yourself the way that you actually are. That's the key, that, that's what being vulnerable emotionally means when it comes to social, social situations. Has anybody lost by any chance? Are we all good? Okay, cool. You guys are like over here. <laughs> okay. So you're going into the social situation, you're being who you are. Uh, no matter what your, fa what your faults are, no matter what's going on, you're presenting yourself as who you actually are, and you're leaving all the filters behind. And we've had preaching in the past about filters. It's like uh, you t you're taking a picture for, for your Instagram or for whatever it is that you want to post on. Instead of putting makeup on, instead of putting any filters on, you just take a picture of yourself when you just woke up, and you're like, I don't care. Here, look at me. That's being vulnerable because you're, be you're probably being, you're making yourself susceptible to people being like, hey, you look kind of weird. What's up with you? <laughs> like, why do you look so tired? You look sick. Like, are you okay? Or some other people be like, oh, you go, girl, natural. You know, <laughs> or, you know, you're, you guys know what I'm saying. So when you're leaving yourself vulnerable, you're leaving yourself susceptible, and it's because of the fact that you're going onto the world and you're presenting yourself with who you are, all the good, all the bad, and all the ugly, if there is ugly, you know? So I want to ask you guys a question because I'm actually genuinely curious and since there's not like a whole bunch of us at the moment, it might be a little bit easier. And I actually want you guys to respond, be interactive a little bit. I want to get your different perspectives on this. Why is it that many people are scared of being their true selves? Why not be vulnerable and actually let everyone see who you, what you're really like? What makes it so hard sometimes? People are afraid of rejection. That's one answer. One or two more. <laughs> you're afraid to show that you're a mess, which is the case a lot. Mm -hmm. All right. But that's part of the question, too. I like that answer, but it's also like, why is it that we're so afraid of showing our mess? What, what, what makes that so difficult? That's people expect us to be perfect. Perfect. Why? <laughs> why? Because everyone else is faking that they're also perfect. I'm also I'm repeating by the way so that everyone can hear. <laughs> like online, I'm not like. <laughs> but it's also good. This is just not why I'm repeating it. Okay, so these are all things that like you, it, to me it makes you think, and then getting your perspectives on on why this is and whatnot. It's interesting to me. All right, so let me make sure I don't lose myself and skip a whole page again. So. So then, like, so part of the answer that I wrote, I think it might correlate to what you guys said. Maybe society has told us what is socially acceptable. And it makes people afraid to be their genuine selves and cautious of not being liked or rejected. Well, like Alina said, being afraid of being rejected. I feel like being rejected is the number one thing to why people alter the way they are because for some reason there's something instilled in our minds that makes us want and or even need to be accepted by other people because it makes them feel valuable or whatever the case is. Okay, so for some reason it seems like it's difficult for people to express when they're going through something difficult. It's difficult for people to, like, to express the mess that their life is. I'm not sure why, but let's just keep going and maybe we'll find the answer as we're speaking. They feel the need to keep it to themselves, to, to, to themselves and pretend that everything is perfect as if your problems make you less valuable somehow. So 
who agrees that for some reason society sees people with problems and for some reason people expressing those problems makes them seem less valuable? I don't, maybe I said that weird. <laughs> yeah, it was a question. So who, I said, who agrees with the fact that for some reason when people express that they have problems or they're like being vulnerable, for some reason society tends to see them as less valuable just because they're going through something, just because they're a mess, just because they're going through something that, that they're asking help for. It's like they're not having that strong independent mentality. It's like, oh, you're seeking help for some reason. For some reason, to me, it's, it seems that that makes people tend to look at you like if you're less valuable. <laughs> I hope I actually said that correctly. Because it was going differently in my mind. But so I'm saying that these things, being vulnerable and open about your situation, whatever problems you're going through, it might make people think for some reason that you're less valuable. But in fact, the opposite is true. The complete opposite is what's actually true. So how many times have we heard that it takes intense pressure or immense pressure for, to make real diamonds? You guys have heard that anal analogy before, like where you need so much pressure and like that carbon or whatever it is to actually form that diamond. Like it, I don't even know how, obviously how many tons and tons of pressure it is, but it takes all that pressure to make something that for some reason the whole world considers to be one of the most beautiful stones in the world. And it's also extraordinarily expensive, and I don't know why. <laughs> but... <laughs> yeah, that all that pressure on my wife's fingers, and it's it was expensive, <laughs> but worth it, right? Okay, so uh, what makes a person even more precious is when they've gone through hell, when they're a mess and they're going through it, and they didn't let those experiences make them sour. I know there's been times where we've compared that to to wine as well where wine has to go through a process of fermentation and like obviously it has to get crushed uh, and all these different things that wine has to go through just to become a wine and the better wines are the ones that actually became sweet. The ones that aren't so great in some opinions are the ones, aren't the ones that went bitter. So do you want to be the kind of wine that went sweet and that everyone, everyone enjoys or do you want to be the kind of wine that had to go through the process and, but that process made you bitter? Or do you want to be the kind of person that went through all this pressure and you didn't turn out to be that diamond. You ended up as what's not an attractive stone. <laughs> They're probably all precious. There you go. You turned out as a piece of coal. And it's like <laughs> all that pressure made you kind of ugly and invaluable. Santa gives that to you because you were bad. Whatever. So. They're the type of people, the people that actually, like, it didn't make you sour. It didn't make you uh, into someone bitter. Those are the kind of people that you can look to for advice. Of course, I lost myself. Because <laughs> they've gone through the things that made it out. They've gone through things, and they made it out with their happiness. And most of all, they made it out with their faith in Christ. There's obviously so many people out there that they're going through problems. And maybe they seek help from God. And maybe they seek help from the people in, in their congregation, in their local congregation. But they don't find the answer because of impatience or because of what, whatever it is that they've been going through. But in the end of the process, instead of continuing to actually trust in God, they decided, you know what? This whole God thing isn't for me. He's not answering my questions. My faith in you has been corrupted. It's, it's almost gone. There's a lot of people that turn out like that. And those are obviously not the kind of people that we want to get advice from because they're not going to fortify your faith. If you go up to a person that went through a problem, went through immense pressure in their lives, and at the end of the day, they became bitter, they became be, became bitter and sour and they lost their faith in God and they're not happy people and you go up to them are they going to tell you no you know they keep trusting in God because that that's not what they did they're not going to give you that advice you're going to go up to the wrong person if you do that you have to go up to the person who made it through life who made it through all the, that pressure and all those problems and all those things that they went through and they came out still sweet they came out as that beautiful gem as that beautiful diamond those are the kind of people that you have to go up to and those are the ones that are going to give you that actual, that, that fortification, that strength, that like breath that you needed to be able to continue, especially when it comes to being in this faith. Because a lot of times you don't get exactly what you want because you want things a certain way, but God sees it a different way. You're wanting something in, in, in like a straight path and God wants you to make circles like on the right and then go all the way to the left. And then go around the highway, make a U-turn and then go back and then you finally get there. And that whole process, you're like, God, what's going on here? 
but he's getting you there the way that you were supposed to get there because that's what's going to make you that diamond instead of making you bitter in some other way. But, of course, it's up to you. So I want to go to James 1, and it says 1 through 27, but I'm pretty sure that's wrong. So <laughs> it's not that long. James, a servant of God and the Lord of Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes, tribes of the dispersion, greetings, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produ produces steadfastness. Or, or what's another word for steadfastness? It produces faith. It produces like a solid person. Hmm? Oh, I thought you said something. I'm sorry? Endurance. I like that word even better. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And any of you, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all who, who reproach, and it will be given to him. So this is just a verse kind of summarizing what I said, where if you're going through problems, if you're going through some sort of calamities, or whatever it is, a testing of your faith that could, that's going to produce endurance. It's going to produce steadfastness. It's going to produce the kind of person who's solid in Christ and who fa whose faith has been tested to the point where you cannot trust in a person like that because they're not just someone who's never gone through anything, but they're someone who's gone through problems, through situations and trials, and they actually made it out. So it's like, in a way, do you want to go up to the person who just got into college to study your, to your career, or do you want to talk to the person who got their master's degree in that career? Who do you want to talk to more? Or like advice in that career? The person with the master's. It's, it's something similar. I think there, there's so many different like things that we go through in life that God puts you through. And it's kind of like he wants to, you to get your master's in every single little area in life. And it's, I'm talking about a master's degree. You have to put in work. It's not just like, oh, I went through this, I'm an expert. No, you have to go through it. And you have to go through it again and probably again and again and again. And, and until God says, Here's your master's degree in this specific situation. And who, know, who knows how many countless things, maybe hundreds or thousands of things God's going to put you through that you have to get your master's in. And he wants you to go through those things for a reason. It's either going to be for yourself, but more, more than likely it's going to be for someone else that needs that from you. Okay? So why am I mentioning all this stuff? Oh, about vulnerability and about the way that people see you. Uh, the way that people see vulnerability. Because society, especially in the States, from what I've noticed, because we have a very a, a, a culture that's influential in a way, a culture that, that's very driven to like be the first in different things or to be very independent in ways, uh, this culture that we have has pushed us toward being independent and strong-minded, people who don't need no help for nobody, those kind of people. And I've seen that in a lot of people, and I've seen that in, in society, and I've obviously seen it in social media where... People are like, you're the strong-minded person that doesn't need help from anybody. I look up to you. When, funny enough, or surprise, surprise, that's not the way that God's kingdom is designed. The world, especially here, sees, sees the world or like people that you could look up to or people that should inspire you to be the ones who are strong, who do everything by, on their own, who can make it on, this, on their own. But then in the kingdom of God, it's the complete opposite because God wants you to be surrounded by his people. God wants you to seek help from all the people around you. God wants you to, to live your life and to like just be shoulder to shoulder with somebody seeking that one goal that's him. And the world, it's all about being individual. For some reason, a very individual mindset. And then it, in God, it's about being together. All doing something to collaboratively, collaboratively. Collaboratively. There you go. Thank you. All for one reason. And that's why they call us his body. Just, just like the, the, the 20 of us are in this place right now. Right now, we're his body. We are the representat representation of who he is as his body at this very moment. His body changes and transforms all the time because it could just be two people, and that's his body right there. It could be 5,000 people, and that can be his body. He wants us to do everything together as his body, to be able to do and, and, and enact his kingdom here on earth the way that he wants us to do it. It's kind of hot in here today. <laughs> so an, an, another thing that, I've noticed, that I notice is uh, it's pretty much impossible, especially when it comes to the things of the spirit. 
it's impossible to do the things that God wants us to do by ourselves. You can do things in the world by yourself. Is it going to be easier on you? No. Are people going to look up to you more for it? Probably. But when it comes to the things of the Spirit, there's no way you could do it by yourself. It's like, imagine you're trying to read the Bible by yourself, and you're trying to have your relationship with God by yourself, and you're trying to pray by yourself, and no one ever showed you anything. You're doing it all by yourself. It's not going to work. Because it's like you're, t you're trying to deny all the experience, all the spiritual uh, spirituality, everything that God has given to the people around you. You're trying to just ignore that and be like, nah, I got this. God's going to be like, stop. <laughs> like, why are you doing that? I gave you all the people around you, your family, your friends, the people have, that have told you to go to a specific church or whatever it is. I gave you all these people and you're trying to do it by yourself. That's not how it works in my kingdom. I want you to be a part of my body. And he always leads you to a specific place. God always leads you to where you need to be. For some people, it's going to be here at New Hope in Christ. For some people, it's going to be somewhere else. But come here because we're awesome. <laughs> and God loves us. And God loves you for being here. <laughs> okay? So, so uh, I want to talk about kind of like the risk-reward type of mentality or situation that you might think of when it comes to being vulnerable. I talked about it a little bit already, but I want to go to another verse, 2 Corinthians 12, 9 to, 9 to 10. Okay. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so, the, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, persecutions and calamities. For when I am weak, I am strong. Okay, so... The reason I wanted to mention this verse is because the ultimate reward for being vulnerable is when you're vulnerable with God first and foremost. I'm talking about vulnerability, and I've been talking about being vulnerable in the world. But the first thing that we have to focus on, and I felt even strongly to, more to talk about while we were in worship, because we were talking about give me Jesus, give me Jesus. Like, you can have it all, just give me Jesus. And I was like, okay, I, I, I shouldn't talk about just vulnerability in the world. I should talk about being vulnerable with God because that's where it actually all begins. You can be vulnerable with the people around you, but if you have no vulner vulnerability toward God, the person that created you, the person that, that we have all this faith and we're coming for, together for in the first place, you're not going to have what it is that he needs, that he wants to deposit in you to be able to grow more in, in, in like this faith that we have. You have to be vulnerable in him t enough to know that it's valuable and that it's important to go into prayer with him, to have that, intim that intimacy with him as often as you can. If you're not vulnerable enough to tell yourself, I need this, it's because for some reason you have some sort of mentality, some sort of paradigm in your mind telling you that you don't need that. You have it on your own. You're fine by yourself. Because when you feel like you need something, you're going to make time for it. And you're going to be like, I need this, so if I don't do it, I'm going to lack. And if you feel like you're going to lack and it's important enough for you to know that you can't lack that thing, you're going to go and do what you have to do so that you won't lack. I hope that was clear. I feel like it was. <laughs> so you have to be vulnerable enough to yourself, which means that it's going to involve your spirit. It's going to involve your soul. It's going to involve all of you and be like, God, I need you. I need this, this intimacy with you. I need to pray to you. I need to open the Bible and, and listen to your word. And I need to be vulnerable enough to you to you, to know that I have to come to a place like this, not because like I'm forced to or anything like that, but I need this. Everything that you tell me that I need, Dad, God, Jesus, however you refer to him, I need it because you're telling me that I need it and I trust you. I'm being vulnerable enough to you. I'm exposing myself all the way enough to trust you so much that I know that you have the right answers. And by trusting you and knowing that you have the right answers and knowing that you know everything because of the fact that you created me, if I go into this, I know it's only going to have the most amazing benefits and results for me. So let's be vulnerable to him first and foremost. And of course, I'm going to keep talking about vulnerability when it comes to, to being here on earth and even more so when it comes to being in the congregation. Because this is like second, like kind of like God's second nature. First, it's your relationship with him directly. And then it's coming to a place like this so that you can experience God and everything else that he has that you won't be able to experience on your, on your own. 
Because like I've said before, like many of us have said before, God's going to give you a piece of him. Just that one piece and your relationship with him and all the dynamics that come with that one piece. Because just imagine that one piece of God is infinite numbers of just, like, it's hard to explain. That one relationship that you have with God is going to open so many doors and so many revelations in your mind and in your heart and in everything that you are. It's going to open you up to, like, your maximum potential because he designed you. And the more you get closer to the to, to the designer, the more you're going to, like, open up those doors and be fruitful in the things that he designed you for. So that's what one piece. Just you and him. He designed you for this one thing, and then you're, like, blooming in that. And then you come to a place like this where everyone else is also being vulnerable to God and to each other. And then you get to have the countless other pieces of God that he wants you to experience. That's why he tells us to congregate. He doesn't tell you to congregate so that you can have, like, friendships or, like, oh, you have a friend here and there. You have some sort of, like, support system. It's not just those things. It's because he wants you to have the full picture of God, and it's impossible without other people. That full picture of God I would never have if I didn't get to know you guys, if I didn't get to know the people in my past that have also shown me pieces of God. We can never, like, just say, like, my past is whatever, even when it comes to the people that you dealt with in the past, because God put you through that process for a reason. So always appreciate everything you've gone through. Appreciate what you're going through right now, and definitely appreciate what you know is going to come because of the fact that you have faith in him. Okay, so... So let me continue. So when you show who you truly are, imperfections and all, there are going to be some people in, in the world that can't connect with you, with your personality. I'm sure some of us have experiences with that where you're, maybe you're being too much or whatever the case is. And you may be rejected once in a while. Unlike when you, put, when you put your filter on to show what everyone wants to see and you have friends, not because, of the, not because they like who you are, who you really are, but because of like the filter that you put on. It's kind of like living, living a lie. And I think this is pretty important. If you're living a lie, knowing that you're putting up a front in front of people just to be liked or just to have friends, you're, you're living a lie, so you're lying to yourself. You're going on into the world, and you're lying to yourself to convince yourself that you actually like doing these things that aren't you. So can you truly trust someone who, can't, who isn't even true to themselves? So if you encounter someone who you know is being fake, it gets kind of difficult to be friends with them because it's like, okay, you're being fake. For some reason, you're not being who you truly are. So you can't even trust yourself. You're living a lie. You can't even be true to yourself. How am I supposed to trust you if truth is like, I mean, lies and like non-truths are all over you? In vulnerability, you may be rejected once in a while. But when you think about it and you see the reward is so much greater than the risk of not being liked by some people, on top of that, <laughs> I didn't say that right, but there's a risk of people not liking you, of course. But there's a, a much greater reward to being vulnerable. And, yeah, sometimes you're not, you're not going to be liked. Sometimes you're going to be rejected. But something that I've always had in mind if you go through some cal calamity in life, if you go through some stress and some struggles in your life, it's actually a really good thing because it's going to make you stronger. I did mention this earlier. But what I want to get through is we shouldn't try to run from hardship. I, I've also seen, obviously, when I go through social media, or like just the way that society it tries to carry itself or whatever, they try to run from, from, from things that they, they're not comfortable with instead of facing them straight head on and learning from them and having a conversation and trying to see the perspective of another person so that your own perspective can grow. But to me, I'd say don't run from hardship. Face it head on and learn from it. Be ready and willing for life to offend you sometimes because God's got your back and you'll survive. Even if you get rejected, even if people don't like who you are sometimes, you're going to survive. God's got your back. But then when you show exactly who you are to the world, you're going to find some people that respond to to what you're displaying because you're being vulnerable and you're like, you know what? I'm not going to hide who I am. I'm not going to hide anything that I am. I'm not going to hide what I'm going through. I'm going to display myself to everyone that I meet a specific way. And when somebody responds to that and you become friends, you know you found someone that you can actually trust because you're not displaying, it, displaying anything fake. 
You're not, you're not trying to put up a front or any filters. You're just giving yourself. And whoever actually responds to that and likes who you are, they actually try to become part of your life, and that's someone that you can really trust. That's a person that you can really call a friend because they know everything that you've gone through. They know everything that you're doing. They know everything that you are. Maybe not immediately, immediately obviously, obviously, because you've got to get to know a person first. But when you're being vulnerable, it's that much easier to get to know who you are a lot faster. So you get to be a part of something, a part of someone's life, a part of a friendship, a lot easier because of the fact that you're not hiding anything. You're not hiding your problems. And on top of that, if you're hiding your problems, how is anybody supposed to be able to help you? If you're hiding what you're going through, and nobody knows what you're going through, but you're saying you're asking for help, how are you asking for help if you're hiding your problems? How is anybody supposed to help you out if no one knows that you're having a specific problem? That's another benefit of being vulnerable. When you're going out into the world and you're saying, hey, I have this problem, and obviously not to suggest anybody. We have to be discerning <laughs> to, <laughs> to who we're talking to and everything. But being vulnerable as a general attitude, especially to the right people, is going to lead you to, ha to notice that your problems aren't that hard because you're getting people all around you who are, especially if they're your friends and they love you, they're going to be helping you with that problem. Okay, I want to go to Galatians 6.2. The shortest verse of the night. Mary, six, Galatians 6 2. Okay, we're going to read it anyway. <laughs> Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Very simple verse, very easy to understand. And it's what I'm talking about. When you're, when you're showing what, who, what you're going through, who you are, when you're showing your problems and you're being vulnerable enough to tell people, hey, I'm going through this. It's so much easier for your problems to go away faster. Just like the verse says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. So when you go up to the person in a place like this, in a congregation like this that you can trust, that has the spirit of God inside of them, and you go up to them with one of your problems, and they read this verse and it says, bear one another's burdens, they're going to see, okay, that you have a burden. I want to go ahead and bear this burden with you. And then that fulfills the law of Christ. And I, I, I interpret this law of Christ as being love your neighbor, love, love, uh, love the people around you, basically. When you're sharing in that burden, not only by telling someone something, but also by sharing and taking some of that burden away, you're loving that person. And that's literally fulfilling the, the, the law of Christ. So being vulnerable gives people also the opportunity to fulfill one of God's laws. Like if you never get the opportunity to help someone with something, it's probably because no one ever displayed anything to you. Like they gave you no problems to solve. They gave you no problems to be a part of. That's probably not going to happen because there's a lot of stuff going in the world. But, <laughs> but it, like it's, it's something that I like to think about as well. If, you, if you're vulnerable and you give people the opportunity to hear about your problems and like you're just giving it all to them, hopefully not too much, you know, hold it back sometimes, be discerning, but be vulnerable in general, it gives you the opportunity to be like, hey, let me help you. And then friendships like spark even harder with that because when you're both going through something and you have something in common, like friendships just become that much stronger. Heart to hearts, yes. <laughs> so when it comes to being surrounded by God's people, you have the benefit of spiritual people helping guide you with the help of God himself through those people. So like I said before, especially when you're going up to spiritual people, you're going up to them and they have the spirit of God inside of them and God's going to be like, God's going to be like, hey, I got your back. But hey, I'm going to use this person to help you out. We have that benefit here. We have people, people here who are all full, full of the Holy Spirit. You go up to any single one of us and we're going to be able to do that. Hopefully we're not like in a, in a moody situation where we don't feel like helping you at that moment. But that's going to be... Our, that's our struggles as well. And maybe at that moment we can tell you, like, hey, I, 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 let me be vulnerable to you. I don't want to help you right now. Leave. <laughs> Not really like that, but we, we, have to give you all, we all have to give each other the opportunity to help each other out. And being vulnerable is the only way that's, that that's going to happen. So uh, when we rely on the people that come to congregations like these, to New Hope in Christ specifically, and you ask us one, one of us for help or you're being vulnerable to us, you're invoking the help of God as well because we're all full of his spirit. You have, you're not just relying on, on human wisdom. You're now also relying on the spirit. You're also relying on God, knowing that God has 
his wisdom and everything in the people here as well. And imagine that God knows that you've gone through what you've gone through and everything that you've done, everything that you've said, and he still sticks with you no matter what. He accepts you and he'll never leave you. You have, the, you have a God that decided to be in your life even before you were born. And he's the kind of God that actually sticks to his promises. Like if, if there's people in your life that are never going to leave your side, and they say it, and you've experienced the fact that they're not going to leave your side, the only downfall to that is the fact that they're not going to live forever. They, you might end up outliving that person. But, but then you have a God that ever since before you were even born, he said, I have your back. I'm never going to leave you. And because of the fact that he sticks to his promises, ever since the moment you were born, he was right there. And ever in, up, up, up until the moment that we end up not being in this earth anymore, he's going to be right there. So that's something that I, I do want us to meditate on a little bit, just knowing that he's there. He's never going to leave. In every situation, no matter what you do, no matter what you say, no matter what we go through, he's never going to say, ill, that's gross. <laughs> like some people might like I don't know just imagine you're you encounter somebody and they're just like sobbing and they're like oh that's kind of gross step back <laughs> he's never gonna do that to you he's the kind of God who, who just he loves you no matter what no matter how ugly you're being no matter how beautiful you are no matter what it is you're not gonna intimidate him he's not gonna fall off his throne he's always just gonna be there no matter what you do even if you sin, even if you go, go against what he, he's asking of you, he's still going to be like, I love you anyway. Just turn around, and I have my hand out to you. And all we have to do is say, thank you, grab his hand, and then come back to people like this who are just going to hopefully do the same thing. If they're full of the Spirit of God, they're going to be like, come back. Like, I don't care what you did. Just come back, and let's just worship him and seek him together. So... There's no way that you could truly belong anywhere without being vulnerable and showing who you are. Putting up a front the nature of not being genuine ends up being the downfall of many people because you're hiding yourself. You're literally putting on a mask and you're not being yourself. And you, we have to realize that being ourselves is something that's absolutely freeing. When you, like, I don't know if you guys have experienced this, but when you're with a group of people that maybe you've known forever and that you could just be yourself, you probably feel like you can hang out with those people for hours, maybe for days, just knowing like, hey, I'm completely comfortable with who I am. I'm completely comfortable with them, knowing everything about me. And you feel like you're free. You feel like everything is good. But then maybe you get into a crowd that you don't really know or that you're not completely yourself with. And it's not as fun. And it's not as nice. And it's not as, as beautiful of an experience. It, it's just something for you guys to think about because there's people that live their lives being fake where they, they feel like I can't be myself because I, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to get rejected. But then there's people who just live as who they are and they're vulnerable and they're completely free because they have nothing holding them back. That's how we should be living, especially when it comes to, to, to coming to church, to coming to our congregation. They'll come in here with masks or try not to come in here with masks or, or being fake or putting on filters because that's not what God wants and that's not what we want, especially the, the, the leaders here. Obviously, it's not just the leaders, but I want to point the leaders out because supposedly we're supposed to be the ones that are full of the Spirit more than others because just because of the experience that we've gone through, just because of maybe the amount of time that we've been in the Spirit, in, in the faith and everything. But don't, don't doubt the fact that there might be someone else that isn't a leader that you go up to and you know they're worshiping God and they're looking for God. And that they might just be able to give you some sort of spiritual advice or advice in general that's going to be a thousand times better than what any of us can say as in the leaders. God does things his own way, and it's pretty amazing. Okay. So I'm actually losing time already. And I haven't gotten through what I wanted to really talk about. So let me skip a little bit. When it comes to to relationships. Obviously, I've been talking about being vulnerable, maybe on just one side. But it has to be vulnerability from both sides because any relationship obviously takes two sides. It takes two to tango. So, and what two sides am I talking about in the context of this preaching? So, it takes participation from two parties, and that's going to be you. Obviously, I'm talking to every individual person here. 
and the congregation, which is the body of Christ. So it's those two entities. It's going to be you and the, body, and the body of Christ. Those are the two people or the two, the two groups, the two entities, whatever you want to call it, the two parties that have to do something about being in a relationship. Okay? There have been so many times that, unfortunately, I've seen people leave a congregation because of the fact that maybe they didn't feel welcome or whatever. But you can never look at that one-sided. You always have to see the relationship, relationship as a two-way street, and you have to realize that when somebody leaves any sort of group, but specifically in a congregation, it's always going to be both sides that are at fault, for the most part. It's always going to be both, both sides' fault. Don't ever think to yourself that it's just you, and don't ever think to yourself that it's the congregation's fault fully. Because, obviously, maybe you didn't feel like anybody in the congregation when you first went there, or maybe after some time of being there, it was welcoming enough. Like, they, were, they weren't talking to you enough, or they didn't welcome you enough in a way where, where you felt like you actually belonged. But at the same time, maybe on your end, you didn't throw yourself into any sort of situations that, that's gonna, that was going to provoke people to actually be in a relationship with you. So with that being said, I'm going to sit over here, and I'm going to pretend like I walked into any, any congregation, specifically New Hope in Christ, and I sat down in one of those red chairs, and then I, I'm talking to God, and I'm like, all right, God, I'm here. Um, but just remember, God, I'm here, and I'm just going to like give you these two hours that we're here, um, you know, worshiping, preaching, and all that stuff. But that's it. I'm going to sit here for those two hours. I gave you my time, and after that, I'm leaving. I don't want anything else. I don't want to do anything else, okay? Deal? That's how some people do it. And then they fail to realize that there's so much more to coming to a place like this. It's not just about let me give you my two hours and, like, you know what? After, because of the fact that I'm fulfilling my spiritual duty of coming to church because that's what you're supposed to do, now that I did this, I gave you my two hours for the, for the week. Go fix all my problems, God. And that's obviously not how we should do it. Never should we ever think to ourselves that this is a one-sided relationship. God, God's going to expect his part, your part as well. If you want God to do his part, you've got to be vulnerable to him enough to do everything that he needs you to do so that you can have that relationship with him. You can't come into and warm up a seat and think, think to yourself that everything's going to magically disappear and be amazing just because of the fact that you're doing your spiritual duty of coming to a service, and that's all you do. I've seen a lot of people do that as well. I was one of those people <laughs> a few years back where I came just to be like, I'm supposed to be here. My mom brought me to church every Sunday, and I sat there, and I was like, you know, because of the fact that I went to church, I'm okay, right? Like that's, all, that's all I needed to do. And I didn't take the time to put myself out there enough to be like, okay, let's explore a little bit more of this whole God thing. Let's explore a little bit more of this faith thing. Like, what are these other people doing here? Let me get to know them. Let me, let me see what God's doing in their lives. Like, if all I cared about was my own perspective in God, and that wasn't enough, especially because my perspective of God and what I needed to do in Him was completely skewed. Like I was saying earlier, it's like I was just focused on me and what I wanted to do, and not caring about everyone else and what, they're, what God's doing in their life. And if you're doing that, you don't have the whole picture. You have your picture, and if you're wrong, you don't have anyone else, anyone else to tell you. You need to align this. You need to remove that. You need to add a little bit of this. It's like you're trying to, to make some sort of, you're trying to cook something, but you don't have all the ingredients. Okay. So I guess since time is actually ending now, I'm going to, ask you guys to close your eyes. Do you mind dimming the lights, Josh? So hopefully with everything that I've been talking about, uh, you guys have been able to reflect a little bit on vulnerability and just being able to know and realize that we need to be vulnerable to God, that we can't just come here and think to ourselves that we're fulfilling some sort of duty just by sitting in a chair and giving him two hours for a week, and that everything else is just going to align itself in the spiritual and like in, in our spiritual lives just because of that. So, well, the reason I ask you guys to close your eyes, and I want you guys to meditate on the next few things that I'm going to say, 
because God wants us to be constantly, completely surrounded by the things of, of him, by spiritual things, which involves his word, which involves prayer, which involves the people that are also seeking the same thing, which is having that relationship with him, just seeking his face. And we need to be surrounded by all this because whatever is constantly surrounding you in your life, whatever you're focused on more than anything, that's going to be what actually influences you. Those are, the, or those are going to be the things that we end up reflecting to everyone else. Whatever you're surrounded by the most is what you're going to reflect as well. Those are, the, those are going to be the things that teach you about life more than your faith in God, if it's not God in the first place. You'll have more faith in the world than you do in God. And if we, if being constantly surrounded by the things of God is unappealing to you in any way, ask yourself, what are the things that attract you more than the thought of having God be in every area of your life? What attracts you more than Him? What attracts you more than the thought of having him be in every single part of your life and we need to remember that the things of God are holy the things of God are what we should try to that we should find truly beautiful but perhaps our definition of beauty has been altered somehow away from God's holiness and closer to something else of the world our perspectives on the things of the world has to shift to prioritize God. And this is what I want you guys to really meditate on. And don't let it just slip by. Ask yourself, what's stopping you from seeing God as your ultimate attraction? What's taking his number one spot away? If you guys actually have something that you can think of, either write it down in your heart so that you don't forget, or write it down somewhere so that you can see it later, and let that be a part of your next prayer. I'm going to repeat the question just so that we can remember. What's stopping you from seeing God as your ultimate attraction? The thing that you seek the most, the thing that you want the most out of everything things of God, the people of God, praying, reading his word, what's taking his number one spot away, what's replacing God as your number one, try to make it a point to pray about that next time that you pray, try to make it a point to pray in the first place, and when you do pray, because I have faith that you will, Pray about that. That's part of being vulnerable to him. Imagine going up to somebody and telling them, hey, this is the reason why you're not my number one. <laughs> to any person, anyone in your life, you go up to them and say, this is why, X, Y, Z, this is why you are not the most important person in my life. That's vulnerability. And anyone in the world might be like, what is your problem? Do you hate me? <laughs> but you do that with God, and he's going to be like, I love the fact that you're coming up to me with this question. I love the fact that you're coming up to me and being so vulnerable enough to tell me to my face, to my, to my spiritual face, what it is that is in the way of you and me being as close as possible. We want to go to where God leads us, but our vision is nowhere near His. We need to believe that. We need to, we need to have faith in the fact that God sees everything. He sees everything in every dimension while we're just trying to decipher one dimension. We don't even have it straight. Not one dimension. He has every dimension. And He knows everything about it. He sees it all. But with the help of the people around you and the ones that are yet to come, we will get to his goal a lot faster and we're going to be tripping and falling all over the place a lot less. And the last verse I want to read, James 5.16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another 
that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. And this verse is extremely important because it it gives you that assurance because God is saying it himself in his word to be with other people because the prayer of another righteous person has amazing power because it is God working through that person. A righteous person is someone who has been vulnerable with God, has that relationship with him, has everything that they can with God in that moment of their lives and they are righteous and you go up to that person with one of your problems because you were being vulnerable to that person and you know that everything's going to be okay because God is working through them. And just to close, I've had the privilege of coming to a place like this uh, originally and you don't have to keep your eyes closed anymore if you don't want originally because as you all know I liked Caro <laughs> shocker um, and obviously at first it was just I wanted to come just to get to know her a little more I guess to see what her life was about even though she had a lot going on <laughs> more than I bargained for especially at the moment and uh but then little by little, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to, without even knowing or like focusing too much on vulnerability, I was just like, okay, I'm going to throw myself out there. You know, obviously I, when I first got here, I, I clicked with some people. A lot of those people aren't even here anymore. And it was cool. But I decided to like, you know what? I'm going to be a part of this family. At first it was for Caro, you know. I liked her and I wanted to, to maybe impress her a little bit or whatever. Um, and even Vanessa didn't believe that I was going to be a part of anything. <laughs> she was like, nah, it's not, this guy's not going to make it. <laughs> but I decided to be vulnerable to God, and my relationship with him grew in a way that I didn't expect. Uh, I became a part of this church, like kind of like a family member, and not, not just because of the pastors, okay, but because I, I made some pretty good friends, some pretty serious friends, and, and nowadays... Uh, I have friends like you know obviously my wife I, I'm married to her to God now and I have amazing friends like Jose and Vanessa even Carissa <laughs> Kaylee Jessica Caesar Joshua and Miriam you guys are pretty cool too <laughs> and just everyone here like even if, if we don't talk much or I don't know you that much like you guys are my family and, and I want to be able to be vulnerable to you just as much as I would like for you guys to be vulnerable to me just like any of the leaders here, anybody here should want to be vulnerable to each other so that we can get to know each other more, so that we can be a part of a family, one that is going to be really hard to break up, one where even if their life is going crazy in spirals, they can come here and feel like they're at home, to be like, you know, like that situation where I said, like, you know, you're, you're with a group of friends that know you really well, and you can be yourself, that's how we want to be here. And I need your help for that. And you'll need my help, not just me, obviously. It's like in a, in a, in a, in a cycle where each person here needs each other. And that's how we want this congregation to be. And we need every single person here to make it so that whoever walks through that door comes and they feel exactly what I'm talking about right now. That's what we want. That, that's the only way that we're going to grow. First, be vulnerable to God so that, so that we can have that, that relationship with him. And so that when we have a relationship with each other, we'll see God through each other. And then anybody walks in here and they're like, okay, this is a lot of God in here. <laughs> and that's exactly the way we want it. So, Joshua, you can, like, put the lights up a little bit as I close out in a prayer. Because if we end this and, and it's all dark, we're going to be like, this is weird. <laughs> okay. So, Abba, we thank you for tonight. And I just ask that everything that was said tonight that we can we can cipher through it, that we can siphon it, Lord God, and just get the most important parts that are going to impact our lives. When we think about vulnerability, when we think about our relationship with you and the people around us, that it be something that we look forward to, Father. That it not be like something that's a burden or us thinking to ourselves that we got to do something 
extra or we got to like be fake or anything of the sort, Lord. No, let it just be something natural that happens because you instill it in our hearts when that we come to a place like this and we be ourselves in every way. And even we get rejected by some people, the people that are going to accept us, especially those who are full of your spirit, Father, we can become like family the way that you want us to be so that we can be all working together like the body that you ask us to be, Father. We thank you for this word. We thank you because maybe we learned something tonight, something that we can take home and that we can just apply into our lives so that it can transform us in a way where we can see people differently, see ourselves differently, be conscious of the way that we're acting and behaving in front of other people so that we can represent you more and more every single day the more that we become vulnerable to you, the more that, that you just love on us and that we get to love on other people as well because of that love that you get to us. I thank you, Abba, for everything that you are and for tonight, again, for the worship up to the word and even the announcements and everyone that's serving, Father God, and everyone that's just here tonight to listen and to get to know you a little bit more. Thank you, Abba. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.